All right. Well, this is our lectionary Bible study. And uh, I hope at least we are properly oriented for the audience. Our audience of one, maybe. But uh, <clears throat> so this is Palm Sunday. And uh, we're in year B. So the not everything changes from year to year. So the, the uh, Palm Sunday readings... Um, this is, of course, we have three synoptic Gospels, so it rotates between those two, A, B, and C. A is Matthew, B is Mark, C is Luke. So we get the both the, uh, oh, what is it called? The, not the palm passage, but the uh, procession part um, early on. That Gospel rotates, so we're, we're in Mark this time, and also the Passion Gospel rotates, so we're in uh, Mark as well, but the other ones remain the same. And then for uh, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and uh, Holy Saturday, those remain the same, but then Easter Sunday, uh, I think just the gospel will rotate between different gospels year by year. Turn to the Palm Sunday section in the prayer book. Uh, where is it? Day is 5.54. We don't have the first, uh, the Palm Liturgy and uh, Gospel, but we'll look at that. It's, well, they are going to be delivered probably on Friday, maybe Thursday. First of all, let's begin with the Collect. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who of thy tender love towards mankind, has sent thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Holy Ghost? Yes. Oh, oops. Well, we'll fix that. It won't be Hooli. <laughs> and the, sort of the tempo and the uh, feel of um, Palm Sunday is like it starts high. So it's like 1929. Uh, stock market. So we start up high and then we just start to crash <laughs> all through the thing. So it gets sort of more more dour and dour, starting out very festive. Of course, it's all about welcoming the king into the holy city of Jerusalem. And we notice that many times during Jesus's ministry, and I think it's especially highlighted in John's gospel, um, people want to make him king. They're looking for, you know, anybody who kind of step up and and be the guy. Uh, everybody wants independence, everybody wants revolution, nobody wants the Romans to stick around, except for the aristocracy and those who are in power because of the Romans, basically, who have something to lose, but especially the, the peasantry. Um, you know, they got nothing to lose except for their lives, of course, which does happen in the year 70 when they come and, and kill most of the people and take the rest off and, as slaves. But they are looking for a new day and a new man, and uh, they will latch on to anybody who seems like this is the guy. And uh, basically the way that you uh, begin a revolution is you kind of stage an entry. Uh, you know, you come in with your entourage. And Jesus has an entourage here. So different times before, uh, especially in John's Gospel, we mentioned they, they try to take him, and even, it even says by force. So I can imagine, like, they got his, you know, arm around his arm, and like, come on, man, let's go, let's go, let's, you know, we want you to be king. You know, you're a part of David's royal family, and so that makes you legit. We need somebody, it doesn't matter who it is, but you're a great guy, you're a great speaker, you work miracles, you know, you heal people, you're perfect. Um, and so he, de he decides, you know, my Galilean ministry is over, my kingdom campaign has rounded up, so now it's time for us to head down to Jerusalem um, for our rendezvous with destiny. And so he, he kind of 
comes with an entourage into the holy city. Now everybody is making their way to Jerusalem uh, for the high festival, holy days of Passover and, uh, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts for a week. Um, so there's, the city is a, a, just a den of excitement. It's swelling with people. Um, and uh, so there's almost kind of a parade, you might say, that forms around Jesus as he gets closer and closer to the, the holy city. Also, a lot of the people that he started with are Galileans. So that's almost like this kind of, not foreign, but, you know, they're definitely outsiders. They're not locals who are marching into the city. And so I'm sure the, uh, the Romans uh, were very much uh, nervous and on guard about it. Uh, because this thing had happened before, in fact, not too long ago, that's how Barabbas got arrested. There was another kind of uh, staged entry uh, in which they came in to the city and created a riot, and uh, some people got killed, um, including, I think, some either Roman soldiers or just Roman citizens. So that's what we have here. And the people who are in the city already come out to meet him. And so this is taken on the first Sunday of Advent in the old lectionary as a typological representation of the second coming. So the king in triumph and all of his glory returns to the holy city. And like any dignitary, uh, the, the proper uh, protocol is you go out to meet him. You line the streets and welcome him in and basically come along with him. And that's what we find described in the second coming with the whole uh, rapture idea. So that the idea of the rapture is not that we leave to stay, but we leave in order to just welcome Jesus right back to earth. So we don't really go anywhere except maybe the sky for a while or something. Um, so that's the, that's the, um, the representation of the second coming. Doesn't he also come in the gate where everybody left for the exile? That I don't know. I, I think I, I but that would be an interesting yeah, kind of I parallel. Believe, yeah, I believe that that is um, that that was part of it. Was he he came in that same gate? It's certainly possible because I know that they came south around to the uh, east side and came across that way, so that would make sense. And they, as they line the uh, the road, welcoming him in with a kind of a parade and a celebration, a kind of ticker tape situation. Um, they're spreading garments, blankets, as kind of, you know, like laying out the red carpet, as it were. Uh, they grab branches and wave them, so it's almost like pom-poms, I guess, or ticker tape, or, you know, just something festive and celebrative. Uh, they, it mentions specifically uh, palm and olive. So those are the two uh, that are mentioned in the Bible and the two that uh, get the most use and attention ceremonially. But any branch of any tree is acceptable for the, the liturgy. So we begin with a, a shout, a festive shout, Hosanna to the Son of David, the King of Israel. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And then we get a little um, exhortation, uh, Word of greeting, you know, dearly beloved, this is why we're gathered here today to celebrate for this occasion. Um, and then there's this wonderful kind of Holy Week prayer about, um, uh, Lord, help us kind of get into the spirit and the mood of the mystery of this whole thing. Assist us mercifully with thy help, O Lord, God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby thou hast given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. So uh, Mark uh, chapter 11 is where we are this year. 11, 1 through 11. So let me... For the palm liturgy. For the palm liturgy. Let me... The triumphant entry gospel. When they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, so these are like suburbs of Jerusalem, if you... We call him that. And Bethany is where Jesus usually stays when he visits the holy city. That's where Martha and Mary and Lazarus live. So he stays with them. 
When they approached Jerusalem and Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and will send it back here right away. So they went and found a colt outside in the street, tied by a door. They untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They answered them, just as Jesus had said. So they let them go. They brought the donkey to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. He went into Jerusalem and into the temple. After looking around at everything, since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So that's how it concludes, and, and Father Rogers always made a big point of there's this kind of tense atmosphere. He rides into the city in triumph, uh, riding on a, on a donkey in the style of ancient Davidic kings, um, extolling the humility of the rider. So we have an illusion. It doesn't, it's not mentioned in here. It's not referenced in Mark, but in uh, Matthew and or Luke, um, we get a reference back to, I think, Zechariah. Behold, your king comings to you, is coming to you riding on a colt, the foal of an ass. Um, so they come into the city. Now, it, it would be expected, as I'm sure happened last time with Barabbas, that they would immediately go after the Romans, the soldiers in the citadel, which was basically next to the temple complex. So I'm sure the soldiers are there watching this and, and very nervous and ready to draw their swords and so on. And they just go into the temple and Jesus looks around and then he turns around and walks out. And it's just like, I'm sure everybody was sort of like, oh, what now? I thought we were going to do something. Um, so there's kind of a big, maybe let down, uh, at least perplexity and confusing time. Um, what follows after that in Mark's gospel is uh, the barren fig tree is cursed. Um, and there, that's, it's... <laughs> It's what the, uh, the scholars call a Markan sandwich <laughs> because it's, it's two parts of the story that are separated by something else in the middle. So what's in the middle is the cleansing of the temple. So as Jesus comes into the city, he sees a, a, a fig tree that doesn't have any fruit on it. And he's like, you know, you, 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 I curse you. And uh, then he goes in and cleanses the temple. And then uh, the next time they pass by the fig tree, it's all withered up. And so the fig tree is an illustration of God's people Israel. They're supposed to bear fruit. They're supposed to respond to him positively. They don't. So they've missed their chance. They've withered. Pope Benedict says that that letdown is the reason that on Friday they chose Barabbas. Right. Because Barabbas was much more of a, of a warrior. At least he's willing to stand up and yeah, do something. That, was, that they thought, okay, well, maybe he'll be the king then. Let's choose him. So. Or if not the king, at least he can be like Judas Maccabeus and right. get things going. Right. Yeah. And there's always been a question which can never ultimately be resolved about, you know, the people who call for him to be crucified on Good Friday. You know, are any of those the same people? Are they different people? Um, Surely there are many people who never lose faith in Jesus, or at least never turn against him. And surely there are many people who are against him from the beginning. Uh, so how much does the, does the masses of the crowds who have an opinion about him, how much does that change? How much do the polls change over the course of a week? Certainly, I think everybody would agree there is some change. And it's a downward movement. Uh, so they, they are excited about him at first, but they do lose faith in him, and uh, many ultimately turn against him. In the liturgy after the gospel, we have the uh, 
prayer over the palms and a blessing of the palms, and then we go out in a procession on the way to the church. Originally in, in Rome, um, this was in two different places, two churches. In fact, I wonder if it says, all through Lent, there are these, what are, what are called station masses. And it says in the Missal where these things are celebrated. I suppose they're still done, but I don't know. It doesn't say anything for uh, Palm Sunday, though. So the palm part would take place probably at a local church or somewhere different from where they were headed. And then they would head to, I suppose, St. John Lateran or maybe uh, St. Peter's. That's where they go today. But they probably just, I don't know where they start, but they probably just start outside somewhere and walk around and walk, walk around the square and go into the basilica. But the palm section is basically set up as a dry mass. It's, um, it's got all the features of the Mass except for the consecration, and what takes the place of the consecration are uh, five prayers of blessing over the palms. And so there's a kind of a parallel with Ash Wednesday in the prayers of blessing over the ashes. Um, and they're very rich, and they recall um, the heritage of deliverance from Egypt and so on. Um, I've read these before. Would you like me to read them, or should we just skip? Well, let's, That's fine. let's read them. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the blessing of the palms goes like this in the old Missal. Increase, O Lord, we pray thee, the faith of them that put their trust in thee, and graciously hear the prayers of thy humble servants. Send down upon us the manifold gifts of thy mercy, and vouchsafe to bless these branches of palm or olive, that like as in figure of thy church, thou didst bless Noah going forth from the ark, and Moses going forth out of Egypt, with the children of Israel. So we, bearing palms, palms and olive branches, may go forth with all good works to meet Christ our Savior and through Him uh, enter into everlasting gladness. So there's a callback, uh, a reference to Noah going into the new world, and also, uh, of course, in the olive branch that the dove brought back saying it's time to leave the boat pretty soon. And then also, of course, the people of Israel going forth from Egypt into freedom into the desert. So it's a big procession. Um, and then there is basically a, a kind of Eucharistic preface. So we get the whole Sersum Corda, and then it's, it is very meet, right, in our bounden duty that we should at all times and places give thanks to Thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, who are glorified in the counsel of Thy saints, being acknowledged by all thy creatures, their only maker and their God. All thy works do praise thee, and thy saints give thanks unto thee, confessing without fear before the kings and rulers of this world the great name of thine only begotten Son. Therefore, therefore with angels and archangels and so on. And then we get the Sanctus, and of course the Sanctus, you know, we get the Benedictus, which is this is where it comes from. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And so in the Eucharistic rite, um, the arrival of Jesus on the altar is sort of a callback to his arrival in the Holy City on Palm Sunday, where we hail him in his arrival. And then we continue on with the other prayers of blessing. So there are, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. We beseech thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, that thou wouldst vouchsafe to bless and sanctify these thy creatures, which thou hast bidden to spring from the wood of the olive tree, which likewise the dove, returning to the ark, did bear in her mouth, granting unto all them that receive the same, that they may obtain thereby protection in body and soul, and that by thy grace, which in a figure is shown forth herein, may effectually be healed unto everlasting salvation. And then the next one. O God, who gatherest together the outcasts, and preservest them whom thou hast gathered, who didst bless the people when they went forth, bearing branches to meet Jesus, vouchsafe likewise to bless these branches of palm and olive, which thy faithful servants shall here receive in honor of thy name, granting that into whatsoever place they shall bear the same, the dwellers therein may obtain thy blessing, that being delivered from all adversity, 
they may ever be defended by thy mighty power, who are redeemed by Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. And then, O God, whose wonderful providence hath ordained even lifeless things to show forth the dispensation of our redemption, grant we beseech thee that the devout hearts of thy faithful people may understand aright the mystery which in this day is shown forth. For as at this time the multitude, by the inspiration of thy heavenly light, went forth to meet their Redeemer, and strewed branches of palm and olive on his way, thereby in the branches of palm foreshadowing his triumph over the prince of death, and by the boughs of olive proclaiming that the anointing of the Spirit was come. For the multitude rejoiced to know that even when it was prefigured, that our Redeemer, having compassion on the misery of mankind, was making ready to fight against the prince of death for the life of the whole world, and by his death to conquer. And therefore obediently they laid before him offerings to signify both the triumph of his victory and the abundance of his mercy. Wherefore we likewise, with sure faith, having in memory their deeds and the signification of the same, humbly beseech thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, that like as thou didst vouchsafe to make us members of the same, Jesus Christ our Lord, so in him and through him we may win the victory over the powers of death and be made partakers of his glorious resurrection. <coughs> and then, O God, who by an olive branch didst command the dove to proclaim peace on earth, vouchsafe we beseech thee to sanctify with thy heavenly blessing these branches of olive and other trees, that for all thy people they may be profitable unto the attainment of everlasting salvation. And then last prayer, bless, O Lord, we pray thee these branches of palm and olive, and grant that as thy people outwardly with their bodies do worship thee, so inwardly with their souls they may serve thee with pure devotion, that they may be victorious over the assaults of the enemy and cleave steadfastly unto all good works. And then we go on the um, procession. Uh, we come to the door of the church. In the old rite, uh, there was a ritual of knocking on the door and being let in, um, which was done away in the, in the revised uh, liturgies. Um, you just go straight into the church. So we'll look at, and then after that, it's pretty much Mass as, as usual, except for the long Passion Gospel. So let's look at uh, the first reading from Isaiah 52 to 53. 52.12 to 52.53.12. I wonder if it's the same every year. Yeah. Yeah, the other lessons stay the same. It's just the gospel that changes. And here we have um, what I call one of the four gospels of the Old Testament. Um, so we have, we have these kind of chapter-long excerpts that uh, really vividly portray uh, the passion of Jesus um, and the, the scene that's going on there. Um, so the first one in typology, uh, I would say, is the uh, sacrifice of Isaac, because there's so many um, foreshadowings that happen there. And then um, in uh, Psalm 22, of course, uh, we have so many things that describe the scene at the crucifixion. And then in uh, Wisdom, I think, chapter 11, uh, there's, much like Isaiah 52 and 53, um, a lot of things that uh, connect with the description of the crucifixion scene. And in fact, so many of these Old Testament passages are so familiar to us as... Um, descriptions of the crucifixion, things like used in Stations of the Cross, that we tend to think they're New Testament passages, but they're all Old Testament passages. So like, um, you know, by his stripes we are healed. So Peter quotes that, but it comes from the Old Testament. All right, Isaiah 52, starting at verse 12. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the sons of men, so that he startled many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. 
For that which has not been told of them they shall see, and that which they have not heard they shall understand. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for this generation, who consider that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So a very striking, powerful passage, very familiar to us. Um, we use this again on Good Friday. <clears throat> I'm told that um, in the synagogue this might have used to been read, but then it was sort of taken out of the list of readings um, after uh, the Christian era uh, began. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Paul Edwards about that on, on Friday to see what he has to say. Because the, at least what I've heard on a lot of uh, <coughs> Christian ministry to Jewish people is that um, one of the things they use is this passage, you know, and, and they don't tell them where it came from. And they think, oh, that's, you know, that's about Jesus in the, in, the, in the New Testament, right? Like, actually, that's Isaiah 52 and 53. Um, but a lot of people have never, Jewish people have never come across this, heard of it. They're not familiar with it. Um, there were different... In understandings and interpretations of this before uh, the, the Christian era. Um, one, I think it was kind of predominant uh, view, was that this is a symbolic representation of the entire nation. So like, as the whole nation was taken into en exile and sort of did penance um, for everybody and uh, then was able to be restored. So the nation personified here is, you know, taking the stripes uh, for all the people um, so that Israel can be restored to God's favor. Others took it as a, a more singular description that this is a person, the suffering servant. Um, some connected it with the Messiah, uh, but it was hard to piece together the more triumphant messianic passages. So some, I believe the uh, Essene community that John the Baptist may or may not have been associated with, had the idea of perhaps there were two messiahs. So there was some, a sort of a triumphant one and a suffering one, and they each had their role to play. Um, it was only, of course, in hindsight that a lot of these details, much less the overall perspective on it, becomes clear uh, to the church fathers. And we see a lot of um, references here um, Let's see, he was, his form was so marred beyond semblance and that beyond the sons of men. 
So we know that from his um, scourging uh, that he, you know, his, his back and front were just torn to ribbons. Um, and so that's probably what you have a reference to here, is that he's been so abused that he doesn't even, I mean, like, what is that? I mean, it looked like a sack of meat walking toward me or something, you know. Um, a man of sorrow is acquainted with grief. He was despised. People, like, you know, had to look away. They couldn't even look at him. Um, but he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. So we get this language here of um, substitutionary atonement and the language of the scapegoat. So we have references to the scapegoat. We have references to uh, the lamb, uh, like a sheep to the slaughter. Um, and so the kind of Passover references, um, all sort of uh, deliverance messages and substitutionary atonement messages. And we get that substitutionary atonement uh, theme hit in probably harder here than anywhere else in the entire Bible, uh, than anywhere else in the New Testament. We get references to it, but not this kind of layer upon layer upon layer that we get here. Uh, other details, of verse 9 of chapter 53, they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. So he was executed along with others who were um, criminals. He was laid in a rich man's tomb. Uh, he was not a criminal. He had done no violence, um, but it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. Uh, this reference to he will see his offspring. When he makes himself an offering for sin, that is, when he gets up on the cross, he shall see his offspring, the, the fruit of his labor. What is the fruit of his labor? The one next to him who converts. Um, you know, when, when Paul, I mean, hindsight is right, because what happened mm -hmm. with Paul was he went and lived with Peter right after his conversion. And he knew the Bible backwards and forth. He knew all of this. It was ingrained in him. Mm -hmm. And so when he heard... The stories he, that led up to the crucifixion and the, it was like it seared into his brain. Wow, this is the Messiah. I mean, it was it was a shocking uh, revelation to him. Yeah, and I imagine the experience was something like deja vu, where it's like, you know, this is all really familiar. Yes. And we get sort of like right in the middle of Peter's sermon on Pentecost, that kind of reaction. And this is just like what the prophet Joel talked about when he said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your young men will dream dreams and your old men see visions and so forth. Well, we, then we go right into Psalm 22. We only have the first part of the psalm um, here uh, and we will use that again uh, the, the entire thing for the stripping of the altar on Monday, Thursday, and then, of course, use it again on Good Friday. So Psalm 22 does a real workhorse uh, throughout Holy Week. Um, I mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again, and I've been trying to track this down, but I'm pretty convinced that... Um, so, of course, Jesus begins to quote Psalm 22 on the cross. Um, and... It's interesting, growing up Baptist, I, I don't know when I ever first heard the connection that, oh, this is the opening verses of Psalm 22. I always just thought it was something that he said and something that he felt at the time. You know, he's just expressing himself. Um, and then, of course, at some point I found out, oh, this is Psalm 22 that he's quoting. And it, we can assume, I think, realistically and le legitimately, that at least in his head, he continues on with the rest of it. Now, why is this? Well, of course, he feels forsaken, abandoned, alone on the cross. And, of course, also there are plenty of little details in the Psalms, that, that Psalm 22, that connect with the crucifixion scene. Um, but also, every gospel mentions this was at the, the third hour. I think that's what it is. Um, and so roughly this is like even song time. This is evening prayer time. In fact, they may even like toll a bell from the temple or something like that to announce the prayer times. And so Jesus is keeping up his routine of prayer 
And if, if I'm right on this, what, what I did find somewhere was that Psalm 22 was the uh, prayer, or one of the psalms that you recite um, as uh, the Sabbath is approaching and you're getting toward the evening hours. Um, so basically, he's just keeping with the routine that he's done all of his life, even when he's on the cross, which is a great instruction for prayer discipline, even when you don't feel like it. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure he didn't quite feel like it at the moment, but he kept it up, even in that circumstance. And, um, and, and in a sense, I think the psalm spoke to him more than he using the psalm to speak to us. My God, my God, look upon me. Why hast thou forsaken me, and art so far from my health, and from the words of my complaint? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season also I take no rest. And thou continuest holy, O oh, thou worship of Israel. Our fathers hoped in thee, they trusted in thee, and thou didst deliver them. They called upon thee, and were hoping. They put their trust in thee, and were not confounded. But as for me, I am a worm, and no man, a very scorn of men, and the outcast of my people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lips, and shake their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, if he will have him. But thou art he that took me out of my mother's womb. Thou wast my hope when I hanged yet upon my mother's breast. I have been left unto thee ever since I was born. Thou art my God, even from my mother's womb. O go not far from me, for trouble is hard at hand, and there is none to help me. And as you continue on, you find a couple of more crucifixion details, like no bones of his shall be broken. Uh, my heart within my chest is melting wax. That's one of the uh, side effects of crucifixion or asphyxiation, is that your, your core begins to feel very, very hot. Well, let's look at the epistle, which is Philippians. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Oh, before we move on, one final commentary is that... Um, one thing we should guard against is a common idea out there, and I don't know if it's attached to any particular church or religious tradition. I remember hearing it in my Baptist days. I don't remember if they taught it in my particular church. I just remember hearing it, you know, among preachers. But this idea that there was any kind of separation between the Father and the Son on the cross, that, uh, that Jesus stopped being God on the cross or was no longer in communion with, with the, with the Father or something like this. This is all a bunch of nonsense. And then it really goes off the deep end with uh, the Word of Faith uh, preachers, the charismatic Word of Faith preachers like, you know, Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and that, that, that crowd, uh, where uh, Jesus goes to hell and is tormented by demons and that's, that sort of thing. In, in the tradition, he goes to hell, the abode of the dead, in order to go there in triumph and and unlock the gates and set people free and so on and give the devil a hard time, not the other way around. All right, so Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Um, and then the... Uh, the subdeacon, when he's chanting this, uh, genuflects at every knee should bow. And then I think it's been our custom here that um, everybody else gets out of their seat and does that too, uh, just as a, an act of devotion um, and solidarity with that. But it's really something that's only required of the, 
of the subdeacon who was reading it. The whole beginning uh, really launches into the theme of Jesus' humility. You know, if anybody can boast and brag, it was the Son of God on earth. But he never did that sort of thing. You know, he did uh, affirm his divinity, um, but he didn't uh, brandy it about as something, you know, to hold over us or uh, impress us with. Uh, he was always meek and humble. Um, he didn't... Uh, so when it says, even though he was in the form of God, that is, even though he was fully divine, that didn't go to his head. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Uh, so he didn't, um, you know, get himself a big gold throne and, and purple robes and all that kind of stuff and recruit choirs to sing his praises wherever he went. He was humble. Uh, he was lowly. He emptied himself. This is, I wonder if I have an entry on kenosis, which is uh, a key word in theological studies, um, which is this Greek word empty here that comes up. So it's the theology about Jesus in his incarnation and then also in his um, execution, emptying himself, um, becoming very lowly. I bet it's probably not in here, but it's worth a look. Oh, there it is. Kenosis, the voluntary renunciation by Christ of his right to divine privilege in his humble acceptance of human status. Paul describes his kenosis aptly to the Philippians. His state was divine, yet he did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave. Oh, yeah, and that's one of the things that's kind of hidden in translation, is that um, that word there, um, where is it? He emptied himself, kenosis, taking the form of a servant, servant, doulos, same word as slave. So we could translate that legitimately, taking the form of a slave. So in other words, he, he is entitled to the highest of the high, but he willingly embraces the lowest of the low. And he do, does so willingly and, uh, I guess you could say joyfully. Uh, in Hebrews it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured these things. And so as a result, uh, God the Father has highly exalted him, um, rewarded him, bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, um, which is not to say that he gave him a new name, but that he, uh, his name will always be exalted and renowned, um, that everyone will have to bow in recognition of his position and authority and uh, glory. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord, Every knee shall bow to show that he is Lord. So he went through this uh, treatment of not being treated by, like uh, divinity. And as a reward of that humility and, and service, he will always be treated like divinity <coughs> thereafter. <coughs> Let's see if there's any... Commentary on this passage. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Yeah, let's see. See, Hilary of Poitiers, remaining in the form of God, he took the form of a slave, not being changed, but emptying himself and hiding within himself, being made empty within his own power. He tempered himself in the form of the human state as far as was necessary, necessary to ensure that the weakness of the assumed humility would not fail to bear his immeasurable power. He went even so far as to tolerate conjunction with the human body. Just this far did his goodness moderate itself with an appropriate degree of obedience. But in making himself empty and restraining himself within himself, he did nothing detrimental to his own power since even within this lowliness of his self-emptying, he was nonetheless, he nonetheless used the resources of the evacuated power within him. Not sure exactly what he means by that. 
It reminds me of Polycarp, who, when he was executed, uh, martyred, um, normally they, they were going to burn him at the stake, so normally they tie you up so you don't run away. You know? <laughs> and he's like, you don't have to tie me up. I ain't going anywhere. And so they didn't, and he didn't. Um, they, had a, they had a hard time killing him. So at first the, they light the fire, and it kind of blazes up around him, so it like makes him warm, but it doesn't go after him. So then they're like, well, we got to do something. So they end up beating on him and, and I think like shooting him with arrows. And so he, he bleeds out and then his blood puts out the fire <laughs> <laughs> underneath him. That should have been, that should have, everybody should have just said, okay, I get it. We're, this is wrong. <laughs> we got to stop. You know? What more of a message do you need? Let's turn to the gospel. <clears throat> so we're, you know, everything is long uh, for this occasion. All the readings are very long. Uh, so I always default to the shortest possible version of it. So what we have in the optional part is beginning in chapter 14, verses 32 to 72. Then the mandatory part is chapter 15, verses 1 to 39. And then we can continue on in an optional section, verses 40 to 47. Is this going to be, is this going to be like we always do? Yeah, so at 8 o'clock it'll be read in, in parts mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with the reader and the priest. And then at 10.15 um, oh, it'll be chanted in parts. Who's going to chant it? Oh, the same, me and Kenneth and uh, Trey. Uh, let me. See. I'm not going to read through the parts that we skip, but um, let me look and see what those parts are, so we can get a feel for what else is there before we pick up in chapter 15. So chapter 14 begins the plot to kill Jesus. Um, so they put together the. Um, the plan to have him arrested. Uh, then there's the anointing scene at Bethany. Um, you know, the alabaster jar of nard. She pours it on his feet and his head. And um, why couldn't you have had her, you know, sell that and give the money to the poor and like, leave her alone? She's doing a good thing. Uh, and then verse 12, the preparation for the Passover and the Passover meal, the, the scene of the Lord's or the Last Supper. Uh, Peter uh, uh, his, the prediction of Peter's denial is given by Jesus. And then we pick up with verse 32 in the Garden of Gethsemane. So that's, um, we, in the long version, we start where they leave the uh, Last Supper to go to Gethsemane and pray and so on. And then there's, of course, the arrest. And they, fall, they hold him before the Sanhedrin, and uh, then we have, at the end of that chapter, where Peter denies Jesus. You know, I don't even know that man. And, of course, the rooster crows, uh, and he remembers the prophetic um, statement of Jesus that this would happen, and he broke down and wept. And then that's where we pick up with chapter 15. I'll read it in our RSV translation here. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council held a consultation, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate wondered. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. <clears throat> and the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he was wont to do for them. And he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have 
to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with a man whom you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the praetorium. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and plating a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck his head with a reed, and spat upon him, and they knelt down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mingled with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who had passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests mocked him with one to another with the scribe, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. But here it is, the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And one ran, and filling a sponge full of vinegar, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that he had thus breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Of course, a lot of details in there, um, but some of the kind of highlights to point out. Um, we pick up after a lot of trial type of things have already gone on. So he's come before the Sanhedrin. Uh, they have done their bit to um, render a guilty verdict, um, and it's not a fair verdict. It's I don't know if Mark gets into it, but the others certainly do, that uh, the witnesses are not proving very fruitful. Um, but he again, he in the end, gets Jesus to um, make another claim of divinity, and he's like, we've heard it enough, he's guilty, uh, blasphemy, needs to be put to death. Problem is, of course, the Jews, being under the thumb of the Romans, are not allowed to carry out executions. You do, you do see some, uh, perhaps, happen that are, uh, you know, acts of the mob, uh, picking up stones to stone somebody. Uh, that almost happened several times with Jesus himself, uh, but they, they don't have the legal authority to do that sort of thing officially. So they have to hand him over to the Romans. Uh, he goes back and forth between Herod and Pilate. Neither one of them kind of want to deal with it. Pilate clearly doesn't want to deal with this guy. Um, he is like, he hadn't done anything. Just let him go. You know, and I don't care about blasphemy. Um, and there's this uh, funny thing with Barabbas about his name, because um, it means son of the father. And so there's kind of like this um, strong and stark contrast between Jesus and Barabbas. Both are claiming to be the son of the father, uh, who is the real one. Um, the son of the father that people are looking for is an insurrectionist, revolutionary, a patriot, 
um, an earthly king, or at least someone who will work to usher in the kingdom. Uh, the real Barabbas, the real son of the father, whom the father has provided, uh, is none of those things. And it's not the people, it's not the Messiah that people are looking for. So they ask for Barabbas rather than Jesus. Uh, Pilate clearly like, um, you sure about that? <laughs> I would much rather have Barabbas executed. And I'm sure when they let him go, they were like, keep a close eye on him and follow him wherever he goes, and as soon as he jaywalks, you haul him back into prison. <laughs> you know. Um, so they take Jesus away. They um, rough him up. Uh, they make fun of him. They're like, oh, you're a king, you know, so we put a robe on you and uh, make a crown for you. Put a reed, a scepter in your hand. Uh, they strike him. They beat him up. I think uh, Mark is the only one who mentions Simon of Cyrene. I think he just comes in this gospel, but I may be wrong on that. Uh, but Simon of Cyrene makes a little appearance there. Of course, he becomes part of the Stations of the Cross, kind of representing all of us uh, uh, who would like to have a great privilege of being there. Uh, so th that um, Afro-American spiritual, were you there when they crucified my Lord? That kind of that sentiment goes all the way back to the beginning. And uh, Simon was one who was sort of accidentally there when they crucified uh, my Lord. Oh, and speaking of the African-American spiritual, uh, so Simon is usually regarded as a black man from Cyrene, which was in Africa. Uh, and in fact, um, one of our African-American predominant congregations in Fort Worth is named for St. Simon. We used to sing it stations that uh -huh. mm -hmm. I used to sing that one instead of the one we've been doing for several centuries. Yeah. I've always liked that one. Um, the whole thing about they offered him wine mingled with myrrh, so that is basically like giving him an aspirin to take the edge off, mm -hmm. but he refuses it. Um, so he intentionally wanted to, if you will, soak it all in uh, and not be groggy at that crucial moment. Um, they divided his garments among them, casting lots. That was foretold in Psalm 22. Um, they put the placard over him that had his crime. It said they crucified him between two robbers. That is the Greek lestus. Um, in English Bibles, it's been rendered robber or thief uh, for a long time. But it's a little bit, it's probably not the best translation. Um, it's more like revolutionary or insurrectionist. Uh, but it, it can have a range of meanings. And, and certainly, you know, they don't just crucify people who s steal everyday things. You know, that's not the type of thing. Crucifixion is reserved for the worst of the worst, the worst kind of criminals, uh, for slaves. Um, so just the fact that they're being crucified indicates that they're not on the cross because they stole a horse or something. Um, you know, you might have been the one to teach us this about um, the king of the Jews, that Pilate, that they thought that they were deriding him by saying he's the king of the Jews, and actually they were, they were being used by God mm. to state the facts. I, I, I thought you... Yeah, and in, in John's Gospel... You know, the, uh, the Jewish authorities see the sign, they're like, well, no, 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 don't write that. Just say, this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Mm -hmm. and then, and like, yeah, it's, it's like, done. Yeah, it's done. Forget it. I've written what I've written, and that's it. Um, and, and there are a lot of uh, cases in the, in the gospel as, as it unfolds how people sort of prophesy in spite of themselves. So we might look at that as an example. Um, also, that the, the high priest, in fact, it goes out of his way to mention it. I forget which gospel it's in. Um, when they're talking about the plot to kill Jesus, and he says, well, you know, it's, it's expedient that one man should die to save the whole nation. Mm -hmm. And it says in a note that he prophesied that year, being high priest, not even realize, realizing what he was doing. Um, <coughs> the whole thing about the sponge full of vinegar, put it on a reed, uh, of hyssop, so the hyssop branch is what was used to mark the lentil, the doorpost, with the blood of the lamb. Um, 
there's the calling for Elijah. There's the idea that Elijah will herald the Messiah. Um, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Um, so there's an earthquake that's mentioned in the other Gospels, uh, not mentioned here, but we have the result of the earthquake uh, with the temple curtain uh, that separated the holy place and the holy of holies was ripped in two, sort of signifying how with the death of Jesus, the, uh, the gate of heaven is now opened. Uh, so the, the veil that's always represented the, the division between heaven and earth is now torn asunder and opened up. In the movie, The Passion, they just do all of this so well. <clears throat> Where that jerk, uh, Pharisee, gets one of the priest gets on this little donkey in all his finery and rides away and 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 he just he looks silly and ridiculous and then I guess he's in the the temple um, that same guy when it and he's and he it's, you know during the earthquake and the look on his face is like oh yo <laughs> And then this last verse in the mandatory section uh, about the centurion uh, who sees this happen, Jesus die on the cross. It says, truly this man was the son of God. Uh, and so famously this was <laughs> John Wayne. I don't know if, I, I probably mentioned this before, but that was in the greatest story ever told. It had like an all-star cast. So Max von Sydow was Jesus and John Wayne is the centurion at the cross. And, and so he did his line and they, they said, well, John, let's do another take, and this time give it more awe. And so I think he said, awe. Oh. <laughs> Truly, this was the Son of God. Oh. Yeah, that's a bad joke. <laughs> I and, can't even imagine John Wayne playing that. I can't either. It's, well, it's not as bad as when he played Genghis Khan. Uh, <laughs> that was a yeah, bit more strange. This is a reference to what is called in Mark's Gospel the Messianic Secret. So you might recall um, this thing running throughout Mark's Gospel about he's misunderstood. People don't understand who Jesus is or what he's about. Uh, the only people he's, who seem to fully know what's going on are the demons. And he silences the demons. And so it's not until Jesus is crucified and dies on the cross that somebody finally gets it as it were. And the, and the person who articulates that is the centurion there where he died. Truly, this is the Son of God. Now, in, in Luke's gospel, he, re, he records the line, truly this man was innocent, which is probably what he actually said. What we have in here in Mark's gospel is an interpretation. What does that mean? Well, he was crucified because he claimed to be the Son of God. And they said he's guilty of blasphemy for that. So the conclusion was, I guess he really is the Son of God. He's innocent. You know, he, he wasn't committing blasphemy. And so that's uh, why, you know, the earth quaked and so on. Now, what happens right after this? So uh, the mandatory part leaves off in verse 39, and then we go, what is it, verse 40 to 47. So what is that? Okay, there were also some women watching from a distance. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women followed him and took care of him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. When it was already evening, because it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, in other words, he was a believer, uh, came and boldly went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. His crucifixion could go on for days. Um, summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had already died. When he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph. After he had bought some linen cloth, Joseph took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and then he laid him in the tomb 
cut out of the rock and rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where he was laid. And then that's where it ends. And I guess that's where we will end. So, thank you. Thanks. See you on Palm Sunday. Yeah.